Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are here to sketch another insect with you today. Um, I was chatting with Avea in the chats and um, she mentioned maybe something lepidoptera e, and I know cicadas are a true bug and not a butterfly or a moth, but it was over here sitting next to my microscope and I really love the starch dark and um, like the black and yellow colors. Hi Hashi, welcome back from Australia. Um, so I absolutely love the colors on this specimen. This is a male, so if I was to flip him over, excuse me. Um, this is a male, so if I was to flip him over, he doesn't have an ovipositor. There's no egg-laying device on him. Um, but he does have really cool eyes. He does, I believe that cicadas do have ocelli. We'll be zooming in and checking out those. Um, I'm thinking we sketch him from a lateral point of view. I do believe we've sketched one cicada before, and we sketched it from a dorsal point of view. And that was a long time ago. So I'm thinking this is our, this is the friend that we're going to sketch. Um, this specimen was collected in Mesquite, Nevada back in 2010. Um, and I do believe it is a citrus cicada. Um, the species on uh, the citrus cicada is Diceroprocta apache. So let me go ahead and just give you that scientific name here. Diceroprocta apache. Um, I will just go ahead and give you the uh, introduction that I did not actually key this specimen out. I picture ID'd it, which is not always the 100% accurate, most accurate thing to do. Um, but after kind of scrolling through iNaturalist and looking at all of the species of cicadas that have been regularly or commonly seen in Nevada, um, that's going to be the species that I think is fairly common and um, uh, what I believe our specimen is. Now, there are some characteristics on our cicada that um, can only be seen from a uh, lateral point of view. For instance, we want to look at the, um, oh man, what's the, it starts with an O. Operculum? Ninety seconds. Yes. Um, so we're going to be flipping it over and looking at the operculum. This is essentially a large triangular piece that goes above the timbre or the sound making device that creates a resonance chamber, which is what makes cicadas so incredibly loud. Um, Avea says, hi, Trisha, how are you? Um, I am... My lungs are feeling 100% better. Um, I was sick there for a moment, you know, inability to breathe, ended up going to the hospital, stayed overnight, you know, that was no fun. But I am, um, my breathing airways are a lot better. I'm mostly fully healed from that. I am, um, experiencing some random pains that I don't know where they're coming from, but I didn't want to cancel a live stream. So if I seem to be out of breath or in just a little bit of pain, that is what it is. None of the doctors don't know what it is, and I didn't want it to stop our live stream today. So we're just going to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did not have COVID. Um, and it wasn't the flu, and it is still undetermined as to what I had. Um, it did take me down for like 18 or 19 days, so it was, uh, pretty rough there for a minute. Um, and I guess now that my lungs are feeling better, the rest of my body is like, no! So, <laughs> that's where we're at at the moment. Um, but I wanted to be here. So, I'm here for you guys. Um, yeah, and no diagnosis. Exactly. And so, I'm waiting on a couple of viral tests to come back to see if it was a certain couple of viruses. But, um, until those come back... The uh, diagnosis is up in the air. They just called it bronchitis. You know, there was fluid in my lungs. <laughs> so, um, we are looking at the citrus cicada. 
And that species is Diceropracta Apache. And I do have my ruler. Yay. All right. So I've got my ruler here. Um, we're going to pull a specimen over and see about um, what she is, what he is measuring. I'll go ahead and uh, turn us over to the table camera really quick. <clears throat> All right, so um, cicadas are interesting to measure because their wings are so much longer than their bodies. All right, um, so we're going to go ahead and just measure from the front of the head to the end of the abdomen, and then we'll go and get the measurement also from the front of the head to the end of the wings so that we have a little bit of a uh, rust estimate of ratios and the like. Um, so from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen... I'd say the specimen is about 2.4 centimeters. Um, uh, just from the body size is about 2.4 centimeters. And then if we wanted to go from the full length from the front of the head all the way to the back of the wings, it's about 3.9, um, about 3.9 centimeters. It's not a specimen that we can see in its entirety underneath the microscope. Uh, we're going to be sketching it laterally, so I'm going to just go ahead and turn my paper now. Okay. Um, for our friend here, we can see... Oh, you know what? Um, I've got a new word for you. Um... I've got a new word for you. This is fun. Um, that is opisthonathus. All right. So um, this opisthonathus is the name for any insect whose mouth parts are facing backwards. All right. So there are three forms of the insect head. Uh, you have hyponathus, where the mouth parts are facing down. These are heads like caterpillars or um, uh, caterpillars and grasshoppers have hyponathus heads with them facing down. Um, opistonathus is what you're looking at here with cicadas, where you've got the front of the head and then the mouth parts are actually going to point backwards. There's a long straw-like mouth part that goes in between the legs. So that's what opistonathus means. And then the third one is pronathus, and that means that, uh, and that means that the, uh, head, the mouth parts are facing forwards, kind of like a fiery searcher or, a, or like a predatory beetle where their head is oblong and their mouth parts are facing forwards. Um, so those are our three head types, and um, they all depend on the direction of the mouth parts. Okay, so um, when we're starting our uh, we're starting our cicada here, and I'm trying to get let's see. All right, I'm gonna just give myself a basic line. I want to give myself a starting and an end point so I know about how long. The um, I know in the past I haven't left enough room for the wings because the wings go so much further than the abdomen. I want to make sure that I draw my specimen so that the wings all fit on the paper. So if I start my head up here and I want my wings to end just before the paper ends, then... Three 
3.9. If we call it 3.8, that's 1.9. This is, all right, so the abdomen, the body is a little over halfway. So if we come into our line, we have marks from the front of the head and the back of the wings. And um, you can almost give yourself like a little timeline of bug. Um, where you've got a very light line going across your paper. You want to go to about half and go a little bit further than that, and that is going to be where the body ends, and then this is going to be about where the wings are going to end. I'm going to move it just a little closer up here. So if that's about halfway, we're a little bit past half, so that's good. All right, so now that we have um, our... The length of our body, what we can do is look at the body. I believe that about half of it is abdomen. So let's see. We have 2.4. Yeah. So at about 1.2, pretty much about halfway, that's where the abdomen starts. So if we're looking at our line here for our body, we can go and we can split this in half also. And that is going to be where our abdomen is going to start. So we've got, now all we have to do is add the head and the thorax in here. And for, <coughs> for the rest of this friend here, we're going to break the front end into thirds. Um, because if we're looking at our microscope, this right here is where the abdomen starts. And then you have one two, three, essentially, where you've got the head, um, the pronotum, or the first segment of the thorax, and then the second and third segments of the thorax are right here in this region. Um, so we're going to just take up here and go divide that into thirds. And that gives us all of the, um, all of the marks for how long our specimen is going to be. And make sure we stay ratio-wise all good. Notice that the head is a lot smaller than I probably was going to make it. <laughs> so, um, it's important that we, uh, that we get this, um, it's important that we get the, uh, the ratios all taken care of. So, here we go. All right, so for the front head region here, um, we're just going to give it, keep in mind, this is a first very light sketch, and we are going to be editing it as we zoom in and check it out, but we're just going to give it a very rounded front of the head here, but then once we get to about here, we're not going to give this a straight line across. You can see that there's a little bit of space for that compound eye, so we're just going to... On the top half, on the top half of the line, we're going to um, arch it out, and then the head is going to kind of angle itself back. This is where these mouth parts are going to be facing backwards here. All right, and I'm going to use this, um, I'm going to use this line here as kind of the lateral line. So if you can see right here where the edge of the pronotum is, and then here where the edge of the wings are, that's that, um, I'm going to work that line right into that space there. So, um, the, uh, the compound eye is right above that line. So you can see we're just going to go ahead and do it that way. Um, the pronotum or the thoracic region of our friend here, let's see, it's going to come up. He's got a little bit of a humpback. And then he's going to come down. Um, the pronotal shield, right, this is the first segment of the thorax, and it's um, the shield on the top. Uh, we're going to end it right here at, the, at our midline, and we're going to give it just a little bit of, an, um, of some shaping on the bottom here to start off. All right. Um, and then we're going to be adding the legs and, like, underneath this. Uh, the... The next segment also arches a little bit above, so we're going to just give ourselves one more arch here. <coughs> and then um, we're going to be angling it from this lateral line up, kind of like this. 
All right. Now, this is where our wings get connected. So our the bottom or the front of the wing is going to sit right around here, and the wings are going to come up and out. Um, these wings... If we move, we, we can go ahead and move our specimen now so that we can see a little bit better. Oh, hey, friend. Where are you running off to? This is our wing. We're going to say that cicadas have membranous wings, right? So they have these clear wings that you can see the veins through. There are no scales or hairs on the vein on the on the wings. Um, and they do have four of them. Generally, the front wing is about double the length of the hind wing. The hind wing line is really faint, but I believe it's right around here. It ends at around about the same place as the abdomen ends, and then the front wing protrudes further past the body. So starting around here, and then we're going to arch it all the way back to where our, our um, wing is supposed to end. So I'm going to arch it down just a little bit to give it some shaping. I don't want the wing to go straight across. And then from here, we're going to come up. And it's going to run essentially the length of um, the length of this space here. And if we look at the end of the wings, they do kind of round down a little bit. Also, the wing venation doesn't go as far as the edge of the wings. You can see that the wings go further than the wing venation, which is kind of fun. So um, once we get to be probably just past the length of the abdomen, our wings are going to start coming down. And we want to make sure that that does stay kind of nice and rounded. So let's see. And I'm actually going to round it up a little bit, too. Yeah, that's how they look. Um, so <clears throat> that's going to be the length of our wings, but we do want to add the abdomen in here. Um, the abdomen is going to be from our thorax all the way to about this line here. So let's scooch our specimen and see about the abdomen. So even though the abdomen is underneath the wings, the wings are so clear that um, it's easily seen. Um, so we might as well go ahead and sketch it. Um, with our, with the end of our thorax, now that we're looking at it a little bit closer, I notice that it comes out and overlaps the abdomen a little bit. So I'm going to make mine go just a little bit longer so that it has a little bit of a point here instead of rounding down because then I can tuck the abdomen underneath it. So I'm going to start underneath that and then I'm going to come up and I just want the, uh, we're just going for the overall shape, right? So we're coming up and then going down. Um, and it looks like the comfortable size for the abdomen is a little bit longer than I had originally labeled, but I think that that's about right. Okay. So we have the overall shape of our head, the thoracic region, we have the abdomen, and we have this outline of the wing. Um, let's go ahead and scooch our specimen so that we can see the bottom and where the legs are. I 
I'm honestly, I'm pretty happy with the way that these legs are pinned. This isn't generally like a, a pose that the specimen would be walking around with. Um, the front leg does... Uh, this front leg does swing forward if you wanted to draw it more in like a natural walking position. Um, you can take this tibia here and just angle it forward. Um, it, it does it does swing both ways. All right, so we've got this taken care of. I'm just gonna go ahead and sketch it the way it is. So, our coxa or our front um our front leg is going to be coming down from here kind of like this and then the femur is going to come up and i'm going to make the femur come up in this direction a little bit all right so we've got a femur we've got a little bit of a tibia and or er, a coxa and a femur. The tibia, I'm going to pull down, kind of like this guy here. And then instead of putting the tarsi back, I am going to put the tarsi forward. And keep in mind, this isn't my final sketch. This is just me getting some stick legs on the paper so that I have something to edit as we're going through. Um, the, uh, the next guy here, let's see. I want to make sure that the abdomen does come below the wing edge just a little bit because we're also going to be adding this operculum here. It's really a little bit of a difficult shape to see, but if you see right here, it almost looks like a thin, light yellow, very thin kind of membrane piece. That's the operculum. It, it's what creates the resonance chamber that helps the cicada get really, really loud. All right, because um, there are many insects out there. Let's see. Let me give me give me a minute first. Phenicoxas going this way, and then our femur is going forward, and then the tibia is nice and long, and then the tarsal segments, and then we'll do the hind leg, which is going to have the coxa coming down. And keep in mind that the um, keep in mind that the hind leg is still connected to the thorax. So make sure that you are connecting it up here um, and not on this abdomen region. So we've got that coxa. Um, then I'm gonna add. You know what? I want this to be more like this. Nope. Yep. All right. The tibia are going to, the tarsal segments are going to go backwards. Yeah. All right. So then we've got the femur, the tibia, and the tarsal segments. Okay. All right. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, uh, with this sketchy outline of our specimen here, it definitely gives us a place to work with. Definitely gives us a, all right, now we can zoom in and check out individual features. And <coughs> now we can zoom in and check out individual features and those and the like. I do have good news though. Um, I have finally um, like bought my airfare tickets and planned my trip to uh, California, which is exciting. I'm going to be in California um, April 
28th, 29th, 30th, and then I'm flying out the night of May 1st. Um, I'm flying into Los Angeles, and I will be at, in, I'll be in Los Angeles the 28th and the 29th and half of the 30th, um, and then after I teach my class on the 30th, I have a rental car that's going to take me to, um, to San Fran. So that's, I don't know, probably like a five or a six hour drive. That'll be fun. Um, I've not seen California before, so I'm excited about that. And then I'll be in San Francisco, um, like late day, um, on April 30th and then all day May 1st. Um, so if you are in that area, um, if you are in that area, I am coming to San Francisco. Um, and I would definitely love to see you all. And I think I will be staying with Akshay that night. So we're going to have to meet up and chat bugs and do the things. And you're going to have to show me the cool parks. Um, I do have, I'm going to be bringing my like black lighting equipment so we can even set up a black light. Um, if we know where we can be outside the, uh, night of April 30th. I have the ability to set up a black light. So we'll have to see uh, we'll have to see about that. All right. <laughs> <coughs> now uh, we've got our head here and we um, we're gonna you can notice that the uh, the compound eye is of decent size, right? Um, it also has this kind of dark banding at the base of it, which is really pretty. I wonder if we we're gonna we're gonna rotate this head just a little bit. Um, the head is a little bit too wide for me to get the entirety of it under focus at one time, but I wanted to make sure that we at least had the compound eye in focus, that you could see that our cicada does have ocelli in a pairs of three, and this right here is the antenna. It's very, very thin and very, very short, but it exists. This is what we would consider a hair-like antenna. I believe the word for it would be cetaceous. Welcome, Susan. No problem. We're just getting started on our kind of final sketch anyway. So we have our outline here taken care of. Um, I think the only thing you really missed was its body length. Um, if somebody else actually wrote that down when I was saying it, please go ahead and share it in the chat so that Susan has the measurements too. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start on this compound eye. It's nice and round and circular. There aren't really any, um, there aren't really any, uh, like, <coughs> um, uh, edges on this guy. Um, so many insects are going to have like indentations or flat with circular on the outside. This one is pretty much perfectly circular. And then the head is going to um, run parallel to the back of this eye here. So we can go ahead and kind of finalize that um, line here. And then um, coming down from the head, we have... Instead of it staying nice and round, I'm actually going to kind of arch it down a little bit stronger here um, because it has, oh, you know what? I was studying the pieces of the head recently, and I think I've got some new words for you that I hadn't used before, which is the top of the insect head um, 
the very top of the insect head is called the vertex. So right here, this is where we would consider it to be the vertex, and it kind of arches fairly strongly down. But then we have this space in the front that almost looks ridged. Um, honestly, I'm not sure exactly what the um, what the I'm not sure what the purpose of all of those ridges are, but I would take a gander, I would take a guess that that has to do with the pumping pieces of the piercing and sucking mouth part because this kind of frontal region um, ends in the mouth parts that go in between the legs. So if we've got this here, we're going to kind of arch that out and come down. Now, with insect head parts, um, some of them, um, the, some of them are like uh, d disputed depending on what order you're working in. Um, but generally, in between the compound eyes, so the front of the head in between the compound eyes, that region is called the fronds. And I'm thinking that the, that's how you would, that that's the word that you would use to describe this guy right here would be the fronds. Um, so I've got this outside piece here, and then I'm going to give a little bit of a space here to add the antenna. So I'm going to add kind of like this ridge here. Um, that is the, uh, um, that's where the antenna are going to be connected. And then we have, um, we do have the scape, the pedicel, and the flagellum still on our little hair hair antenna or cetaceous antenna, um, but they're pretty tiny. So we've got the uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> the uh, scape, the pedicel, and then the flagellum is that hair-like part. I'm just going to go ahead and erase the front of the head now, and it's not very long. Probably kind of like that. And then I am going to sketch these ridges in here. I'm going to do it fairly light. And they come all the way down to around here. Um, and you know what? I think that Terry is in the way. Yeah, so it does kind of come down to a point. So instead of it being so wide at the top... Um, these guys kind of get narrower and then they get really small at the end. So that is like the little cicada face mask. All right. And so from here, I'm just going to take this and I'm going to angle it backwards. And that is the shape of our head. Um, at this point, I know we can continue with the thorax, but... I want to flip the specimen and show you the mouth parts. So this is what the head looks like from a uh, ventral point of view or from the bottom. Uh, you can see right here, that's that whole like face mask part of our cicada. I would, def I would call it the fronds being right in between the compound eyes. Um, then you might even be able to say this little triangular piece here is the clippius, which is generally the next part of the head that's going to connect to the mouth parts. Um, and then here, you can see it almost looks like a, uh, it almost looks segmented and like there's two pieces here. That's that piercing and sucking mouth part. And it runs in between the pairs of legs along the bottom. Now, there is a central straw and then there are two outer pieces that are considered the sheath. So that when the uh, cicada is feeding, it's going to um, kind of open that sheath a little bit and then use the straw-like mouth part to pierce into a tree and drink from it. 
Would we call that a rostrum? Yes! Exactly! The, uh, that, that piercing and sucking mouth part is called the rostrum. Um, and because our cicada has a piercing and sucking mouth part, that means that our cicada is in the order Hemiptera, which are the true bugs. Now, that's kind of funny because, um, so many of the true bugs have, so many of the true bugs are in the family Hemipterans have half wings or hemielytra, which is where they get the their order name from. Um, but the cicadas and aphids and a couple other um, true bugs uh, break that rule. How dare they? It looks a lot like a wheel bug mouth part. Exactly. It's the same mouth part as a wheel bug. It's going to be the same mouth part as a giant water bug or a stink bug or an aphid for that matter um they and the um the image is looking low res oh no did i fix it at all Okay. Um, all right, so that's what the, we are. Now, because our specimen is already upside down, I'm just going to show you the rest of the lateral or the ventral things um, before we turn it sideways again. Okay. These... All right, very good. This big triangular flap here and this big triangular flap there, they are called the operculum. Um, those are called the operculum, and they create a resonance chamber for the um, for the sound making organ. Um, so we the sound making organ is underneath the operculum and is called the tympum. Timbal. Yes, the timbal. Um, <coughs> all right, so you've got a timbal that exists underneath the operculum. And um, a lot of people think that um, cicadas, because their sound sounds kind of buzzy, that they're stridulating or rubbing two parts against each other. But that's not the case. Things like crickets stridulate and they rub their wings together. Or like um, certain species of beetles, like certain species of longhorn beetles, will rub their abdomen against their elytra to stridulate, um, which means that you're rubbing one against another. A timble works a little differently. Um, if you've ever taken kind of like a, uh, a harder piece of plastic and engraved yourself like a square with an X in the center, um, I don't have an example right now, but the temple, how it works is it has... <laughs> it looks a little bit like this. It has this shape. And then it has these striations that are hard on it. Um, and the timbal, the way that it makes noise is it's, um, is it's shaped a little bit like this. And then it pops this way. And it pops this way. And it vibrates really fast going back and forth. And that's what makes the sound. It's almost like a... Um, almost like the, uh, like a drum. Um, and so that, doop, 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 um, is how they make their sound. And many insects who need to increase their sound or increase their ability to, um, feel heat or increase their ability to see radiation, there's all, in, infrared, um, there's all types of insects that actually use these kind of, um, 
these sound chambers or resonance chambers to increase their ability to do things. Like um, in cicadas, they use the operculum to create that resonance chamber to make their sound louder. Um, and there's another beetle. Um, it's called the fire chasing beetle and it has the ability to feel heat from forest fires from miles away because it picks up um, very very small pieces essentially of the um, it picks up very small pieces of the uh, of the heat and then that bounces around in a resonance chamber so that it resonates enough so that they can sense it it's really cool is this a male yes this specimen is a male if we scooch all the way down to the end of the abdomen there is no ovipositor so if we look around here it just looks kind of flat and triangular here at the bottom Females, I actually do have a female sitting next to me. It's not of the same species. But because I have it, I'll go ahead and show it to you. This is a female, and the end of its abdomen almost looks like it's split in half like this. And then there is a small sword-like organ in between those called the ovipositor uh, that it uses to lay eggs. So females have ovipositors, ovipositors or egg-laying devices, and males do not. Um... That female can use her ovipositor to lay eggs um, under the bark. She kind of uses it to saw into a branch, and she lays her eggs under the bark of the branches of the tree. And then once the eggs hatch, the baby, the baby nymphs, the baby cicadas, fall to the ground. And I always think that that's kind of like a funny thought because like all of these itty bitty brand new hatched cicadas are just falling from the sky and like landing on the ground. And then they end up, you know, going underground and some of them don't see light for 17 years. Ah, yes, very cool. So, um, <laughs> that's awesome that you are taking pictures of the tops and the bottoms. So, I believe, don't quote me on this, but you will see the timbal on the males of the cicadas or that sound making device. And I believe some species have the operculum and some do not. Sucking on tree roots and planning their take takeover. Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. All right. So um, the only thing I haven't added to my head are those little ocelli. So I want to make sure I get these little guys in there. Uh, you can only see two from a lateral point. This one and then the medial one. Um, I'm also going to cross hatch within the eye. All right. Um, now with our next segment here, I just kind of boxed it out, but now that we're looking at it, there is a little bit of shaping and I'm also going to want to add the banding of yellow here. So, um, from the top, instead of just coming straight down, I'm going to arch it kind of in towards the body and then come out in this way. And then from here, I'm going to give that kind of central divot. So we're going to kind of arch it once about halfway and then straighten it out and come down. Sort of like that. Um, and then from the bottom of our pronotum here, uh, it does angle down a little bit. And then you've got that um, lobe here on the side. There we go. So that's gonna, I'm, um, I want it to be, I 
I want it to be shorter. Okay. I'm shortening my pronotum. Just by a little bit, but I think that that will help my sketch. All right, so then um, I am actually pretty happy with this top arch here um, for the second and third segments of our thorax. And it does come down over here to a point, so I'm going to make sure that this comes pretty sharp. And then the um, the angle, instead of it coming kind of straight like I have here, we're going to just, um, we're going to arch it just a littlest bit like this. And then I'm going to erase all of these sketch lines inside because we don't need them anymore. All right. Um... From this point, uh, let's go ahead and zoom in on the legs. We'll just sketch the specimen from the front to the back. Do they go through a metamorphosis at all? Um, cicadas go through what we call simple metamorphosis. So we call it simple metamorphosis. It means that they have three life stages. They have the egg, the nymph, and the adult, but they don't have a pupa or a chrysalis or a cocoon. There is no resting stage. Um, that's why we call their babies nymphs and not larva, right? So larva is the name of an insect that has a complete metamorphosis, um, meaning that it has some type of resting stage, a pupa or a chrysalis or a cocoon. Um, and uh, simple metamorphosis insects have what we call nymphs. They just grow up, and then they get wings and can fly. If you stand under a tree during an emergence, you'll soon have nymphs try and climb up your legs. <gasps> That's awesome. I have a... <coughs> I have a picture of me um, from when I went and I followed the cicada emergence that uh, I went out really, really early in the morning before it warmed up and it was too cold for the cicadas to fly, but they were all over the place. And so I was holding like 12 or 13 cicadas all in my hands and I thought that that was, it's just a really cool picture. All right, so our, uh, our legs are coming down here, and you know what? These legs are pretty thin, and they don't have a whole lot of characteristics, so I'm going to be following my lines that I've already kind of set up. The coxa is angled backwards this way. The femur is coming up in this direction. I'm adding, um, I'm adding this piece here, which is that lateral point part of the mouth part. You're going to be able to see just a little bit of it in my sketch, and that's fine. Um, I left a little bit of room for it. And then the tibia is actually pretty long. It goes from, tibia goes from here at this knuckle joint all the way down to right around here. Nice long straight. Kind of uh, no hairs, no spines, kind of boring. I'm making my um, tibia just a little bit longer than I originally planned. I think that that um, that the tibia is just a little bit. You know what? Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm wrong. That does look good. Okay, so we've got the tibia, and then we're going to zoom in on the tarsal segments because I can't count from here, and if I can't count, then you probably can't either. So during those 17 years, it's possible to dig into the tree roots and accidentally uncover nymphs? Yes, it is, although... They are really, really deep in the soil, so you have to dig pretty deep to find the cicadas. I'm not sure exactly how deep you would have to go, but deep, <coughs> like feet down. They're not at the top. 
I'm counting three. Uh, one small one here, a second small one, and the third one is fairly long with the claws. I have only dug up a cicada one time, and I believe that that was not a 17-year cicada. I believe it was a dog day cicada. Um, dog day cicadas come out biannually, and in the locations where there are dog day cicadas, even though they come out every other year, you see them every year because there are two generations that alternate. All right, so um, now that we can see kind of the bottom here, I do want to add our wings. The wings are going to be connecting right here to the pronotum. Keep in mind the first pair of wings connects to the first thoracic segment. So they're connecting up here and then arching down. And you know what? I'm just going to give this entire arch here. I'm, pr I was, I'm pretty happy with mine. And as long as it kind of um, moves down a little bit and then arches up. Oh, come on, Mr. Pencil. Here we go. All right, very good. Um, so now that we have that wing taken care of, I really what I really want to do is finish the um, is finish the legs before moving up to the wings and the abdomen. Um, so if we come right around here, the uh, next segment of the legs are going to be coming down. So um, our front leg is angled backwards. Our middle leg is going to do the same, and it is going to be. Connected right here underneath this second segment of the thorax. I'm just giving myself the coxa here, and I'm making it this kind of teardrop shape so that my femur can come up. So we've got the coxa coming down the femur coming up, and then the tibia is going to come down. And the tarsal segments are the same as the front leg. So um, two small segments and then the third one that's a little bit longer with the two claws. The tarsal claws. Uh, I'm going to fix the angle on that one. I want them to come down towards the viewer like these are. Yeah. I'm going to split it in half. Man, I want them to look natural. That's better. All right, so we've got the front leg, the middle leg. The hind leg is going to be the same idea. 
Um, the hind leg on my specimen, you can see if you look right around here that the femur is actually coming straight towards the camera. So if we were to sketch it the same way we're looking at it now, that femur would pretty much be nothing and you would be starting on the tibia. But I kind of want to not have the leg stretched out so much. Hey, the hind leg has some tibial spines. Cool. You've got two on two on the lateral and then one at the very end. <coughs> so our coxa is going to be coming down once more. And I'm going to be doing essentially the same thing I did for this middle leg for the hind leg. But the femur is going to be just a little bit shorter, I think, because it is coming a little bit towards the viewer. That's fine. All right, so then our tibia is nice and long, and it looks like the tibia, um, the way that the leg is situated on this side, the leg actually goes all the way to the back of the abdomen. So I'm going to say that our tibia is really long and that um obviously wasn't the best straight line ever but we're gonna try that again so when um, we're talking about cicadas there is a really interesting fungus that emerges with the cicadas the fungus goes dormant for 13 and 17 years and then once the cicadas emerge the uh, fungus attacks the cicadas it is an entomopho entomophagus fungus meaning that it is an insect feeding fungus and it's specific to cicadas now it lives in the soil um, so it kind of, the spores, they pepper the ground and the grass, and then once the cicadas emerge through the grass and emerge through the soil, that's when they pick up this fungus. And, um, the cicadas, uh, the fungus will attack the cicadas, they're all of their non-vital organs first. So it starts, um, and it actually starts in their reproductive organs. Um, and so the cicadas, when they're infected by this fungus, they don't have the ability to lay eggs anymore, but they still have the ability to mate. And this fungus is transmitted by cicada mating. It's kind of like a, a sexually transmitted fungus for cicadas. And... Um, and so they'll transmit during during copulation, and um, these cicadas. If you ever if you've ever been to like a real mass emergence of cicadas, you'll have noticed that some of them, the back of their abdomen seems to be gone, and there's this kind of white fluffy stuff coming out of the back of their abdomen. That's the fungus, and there are some entomologists that call those cicadas salt and pepper shakers of death. Um, that makes me laugh because the cicadas at that point, they still have the ability to fly around. They're still moving around, except that their entire abdomen is this fungus and they're spreading the spores all over the ground wherever they're flying. So we've got legs. You wonder what gives them the signal to go to the surface, something to do with their internal clock. Um, cicadas are... 
sorry. Um, uh, cicadas are, uh, they have, they're based on degree days. So, instead of basing it on any type of clock, um, or any type of like internal clock, they base their growth rates on temperatures. And because they are all existing in the same, um, in the same temperature space, they all emerge at the same time. There is a specific number, um, and I don't remember it off of the top of my head, uh, but it is in my YouTube video about cicadas. I have a, uh, I have a YouTube video about the salt and salt and pepper shakers of death um it's like once the once the temperature gets to be a certain degree at like 15 inches below the soil that's when the cicadas will start emerging so if you follow the te if you follow soil temperatures throughout the years you can actually determine exactly when the cicadas are going to be emerging Alright, I am actually pretty happy with the overall shape of my wings, so I'm going to give myself this outline really quick, and then when we add our, um, and then when we add our wing venations in there, that's what we're going to be doing. So we're adding our wing venations in here to our wings. <laughs> He's so cute. I love him so much. All right. Nature does truly horrible things. Yes, that's true. Um, so the coastal vein or this bottom vein here is actually pretty thick. So I'm actually, I'm just going to thicken this bottom part here. Kind of like that and then as we come up there is almost this like little um quadrangle here at the base that comes up out and back and that's where all of the veins are going to be connected to <laughs> some of the truly horrible things are the insects i don't know I don't know about that one. Yeah, I guess that's true. Parasitoids are pretty awesome. I raised um, Trisulcus japonicus, the um, stink bug egg parasitoid, for years. The baculovirus and caterpillars, yeah. And then the entomophagus uh, fungus in ants. <sighs> All right. So from this piece here, we have three veins that are coming out. We have one at the bottom around here, one at the top right around here, and then you would, I believe that this one right here that kind of follows the base of the wing and comes up like that, that's what we would consider the anal vein. All right, so we've got these guys. And then this one is going to kind of arch back down and meet back with our costa, kind of like this. And it has this central kind of arch here. That's where another vein is going to be coming out. And this one continues, and right about where it gets to the edge of our abdomen, it becomes a Y. This one is going to be arching up towards the edge of the top of our vein here. And then this kind of meets him here, 
And we've got another vein that comes out right around here, arches down and comes up. Now with this guy here, right here where we have the uh, this kind of this Y split, there is a cross vein. And then after this Y, if we go down, um, we're going to follow this vein, kind of comes out like this. And then we've got a V that starts another vein that comes out in this way. And from here, right about where this vein comes down and meets our costa, or this really thick vein on the bottom, we also have a vein that comes up and this way. All right, so uh, we're about halfway there. Let's go ahead and see what the rest of this vein, let's look at what the rest of this wing looks like. Ah, pretty much what I expected. All right, so um, when we're looking at these veins, you can notice that the veins do not go all the way to the edge of the wing. So um, once we get to right around here, instead of it coming up the edge, we're going to kind of round it off. And um, we're going to give our wing kind of like this outer border that comes all the way back to about this one where it was back here. Now the rest of these veins, they can just move, um, they can just kind of continue themselves um, forward to those edges here. And then we do have one additional one that comes out of the bottom and comes up like this. Now there are also a handful of cross veins and honestly I'm not sure how important some of these cross veins are, but let's go ahead and add them. We've got one around here and then we skip two and we've got one right around here. There you go. And that gives you cicada wing venation. Now, um, <coughs> it's so pretty it makes me not want to add the abdomen. <clears throat> Let's do it. I don't think we'll mess it up. Now, this cicada, when I pulled it out, I'm honestly, I'm not sure. There is a little bit of a white patching on the end of the abdomen, but it's not completely gone like many other cicadas that are really, that were really infected by that fungus. Um, but there is this little white patch here, and I did notice on some of the other images of this species, uh, the citrus cicada, that they exist too. All right, so if we count the abdominal segments, um, I'm just going to do it with my mouse. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It makes me want to say nine, but I believe that there are additional segments at the end that I missed. Here's the cicada. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nope, there are nine. Oh, there is 10. There is a little itty bitty segment at the very end. Um, so there are, are 10 abdominal segments, A1 A one to 10. We could put the fungus instead. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's funny. 
Um, I'm just going to add it really light behind here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give myself, I kind of already have the outline for the abdomen very light behind here. So what I want to do is kind of imagine where those abdominal segments are. So we're going to go right around one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So um, now I have the approximate um, where the abdominal segments are. It is a little bit stepped. So what I'm going to do is kind of just give myself, I'm going to create each one of these segments individually and just kind of step them down each time. And I'm doing them very light so as to not um, mess with the uh, so as to not mess with the abdominal segments. And then let's see, they are gonna shelf off a little bit like this. All right, I'm happy with that. And I'm just gonna darken it just a little bit with the graphite. He's so pretty. You know what? I think that this is a significantly better cicada than the first time that we tried to sketch it. Um, I was never really happy with the first time we sketched a cicada because I got the uh, I got like the size ratios all wrong, and I think I know exactly. Huh. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you know what's funny? The um. The last time that we sketched a cicada was March 10th of 2022. So almost, almost exactly a year ago to the day. And we sketched this time on a lateral point of view. But this was what I sketched our first time from a dorsal point of view, kind of with one side with its wings open and one side with its wings closed. And it went way off of the paper. And I think a couple of these places are a little bit off. I'm so much happier. Um, I'm so happy to be able to look back at some of my old sketches and really um, be able to see. It was, it was a different cicada. This was a desert cicada. Um, so it was a little bit wider. It was a different colored. Um, different species. I believe that this cicada was also from Mesquite, Nevada, but I think it was the, um, the red and yellow color form, whereas this one's kind of the black and yellow citrus cicada. That's so cool. Yes, um, the uh, back leg also has three tarsal segments. Um, so the tarsal formula is three, three, three. And generally we put dashes in between the numbers rather than commas. If you want to be picky, um, if uh, that's how, this is how we write tarsal formulas. Some cicadas do have those wide froggy faces. Yes. And so that guy, um, that species did have a wide froggy face. So, I mean, we were correct. We were accurate in that. Um, I'm just so happy with this one. We did such a good job. All right. So um, this is the Citrus Cicada Diceroprocta Apache. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have been on just a little bit over an hour. Um, and I would normally stick around a little bit, but I am thinking that I want to get a little bit more sleep tonight than previous nights. So, um, I hope that you have all had a good time chatting with me about cicadas and salt and pepper shakers of death and their head shapes and all of those types of things. Um, I always enjoy chatting with you about bugs, and so I super appreciate it. Um, let's see. We're going to go over to the live stream closer. Aha! I don't know why it's just my, my camera is shifted on this nowadays. Um, so this is out school. It's a platform where I teach students. I was finally, um, I finally got out 
school to agree to let me pin insects with students on an ongoing base basis. So this last week I was able to reach out to some of my students and we're all really excited to start um, pinning together. Um, and um, now that I'm going to be pinning on a regular basis at least once a week, I should be also doing good about adding more specimens to my collection so we have more insects for live stream purposes. Um, when I have time, can you put your bug nights on the Wild Wonder website calendar? Yes, I can do that, Avea. Thank you. Um, my question to you is... I don't know where it's going to happen yet. Um, I have to pick a spot. So I guess I will reach out to Akshay and see if there's a, like a local park that would allow us um, to blacklight. Or I guess I can Google some national forests in the area. Um, national forests are really good for insect collecting because you don't need a permit to collect in a national forest. You do generally need permits to collect in state forests. Um, this is your reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel. This is my QR code that you can donate to Insectopia to help me keep my specimens alive and happy. And this is my email address, Trisha at theinsectopia.com, if you would like to share your sketch with me. This is what my sketch looks like from today. Um, it is, oops, wrong way, ha. Um... The Citrus Cicada, Dicearoprocta Apache. Oh, I meant these live streams here. Oh, I thought that they were on the calendar. I thought that these ones were on the calendar. All right, I will double check and make sure that they are they are on an ongoing basis. Um, very good. Okay, so have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, have a, have a wonderful rest of your night. As I, um, as I find free time in my schedule, I do plan on traveling around and seeing people and collecting with people. So this time it's California, but next time it could be your region. So, um, stick a, stay tuned, stick around, and, uh, I'll get there because I need to make it to every state in the United States anyway. I've hit 34. I've collected insects in 34 out of the 50 states, and there are definitely some that um, that I that I still need to hit. So have a wonderful rest of your night and stay buggy. Bye.